Welcome. Thank you for coming to our salon with my precious Paris writers. Um, for new people, I'm Erin Byrne, and I'm the author of Wings, Gifts of Art, Life, and Travel in France, the editor of the Vignettes and Postcards series. We're going to talk about one of those books today. Um, my mm -hmm. triplet books all came out in the same year, 2016, so they're five years old this year, so I'm celebrating their birthday. Uh, I'm the writer of the Storykeeper film, and I'm really excited because it is a finalist in the uh for best doc at the Hague global cinema film festival about taking risks in writing and um anna and i that workshop sort of became vignettes and postcards from paris uh anna and i had always wanted to get the two groups together and we always wanted to publish their work. So we did, we put together this anthology called Vignettes and Postcards from Paris. And the first edition of it, I'll talk more about it later, but the first edition we just self-published, it's coming on to its third edition now. Um, but anyway, that the leaping into the void about taking risks, um, it's something that I, I still use all the time. Like it's that thing of if you're a writer and, and you say, okay, I got to put that in there. I'm working on a novel. And the other day, one of my characters did something that was so, it was absolutely perfectly in character, but it was so surprising and rather shocking that it was a real risk to keep it in the novel. So um, if we get time, we'll talk about that taking risks. And, um, anyway, Anna continued teaching at Shakespeare and Company this workshop, and then I would kind of teach whenever I swooped into Paris. So um, these three, I think they, between the three of them, they came to nearly every one of the workshops that I taught. And then I also had these salons like this one now, um, private salons in my apartments in Paris. And they, I think these guys, nearly came to everyone. Um, Jane and her husband, David, led one on uh, Charlie Hebdo, and Philip led one on way ages ago on Menifee and Satire. And I think Martin, Martin, I kept trying to get Martin to lead one, but I don't know if I could ever really convince him to do that, but he attended most of them. Um, so anyway, for the past seven years, these writers have continued to meet in this writing group. And I know that they're really excited to kind of share how they challenge and inspire each other in their various genres. So I'm gonna introduce each writer right before their presentation. And then we will do a very short kind of presenting of vignettes and postcards from Paris. And then I'm gonna interview them. Now, normally we do have kind of a robust Q&A session, but today, because I have three guests, we probably aren't going to get to that. So um, uh, during the interview, they're going to talk about their own writing and how they inspire each other and more about Paris. So we'll start with Martin. I'm so excited to introduce Martin Rame and have you get to know him. Martin writes humorous, creative nonfiction, spanning subjects as diverse as dental floss, newspaper delivery, and elevator etiquette. His work has been published in Upstairs at Duroc, Vignettes and Postcards from Paris, Something Else, Sudden Twists, and other publications, and has been shortlisted for the Paris Short Fiction Prize. He is an experienced Toastmaster who for the past 20 years has entertained and energized demanding, demanding audiences. Martin's career spans 40 years in computer systems, software, and AI. And I asked Martin to present today because he is a firecracker of writing fire. He's a leader, an incredible stage presence, an insightful observer, and his writing is delightful. 
His genre is light memoir, and he has nurtured his work, brains, and heart. And I'm going to just, before Martin goes, I'm going to just remind everybody to please, please hit mute on your, on your microphone. Um, thank you. Okay, Martin. Thank you, Aaron. The topic handed to me by Aaron is how do successful writing workshops break down barriers to inspired writing? Number one on my list of barrier busters is extraordinary teachers. I spent four years enrolled in a weekly workshop architected and led by one of the best, a lady named Anna Pook. Her lesson plans never failed to stimulate, educate, and inspire. Her critiquing was generous, sensitive, and insightful. Number two on my list of barrier breakers, stimulating writing prompts. Anna read out a prompt, and my brain would be a buzz with stories that begged for expression and mesh with my penchant for writing light memoir. But then, two years into the workshop, Anna proposed the prompt, Too Hot to Handle. It was called Loss and Discovery. It triggered memories of the day my first wife stormed out of our apartment for good, and I was on my own, single father to our two-year-old son. No chance here for light memoir. Up came the writing barriers, pain, timidity, and embarrassment. I wrote a tortured first draft to this writing prompt, the second draft was impossible. I was saved by barrier buster number three, handouts. Anna's genius was choosing extracts from the likes of Didion, Roth, Carver, Mansfield, and lesser likes like Roger Rosenblatt, who wrote an award-winning memoir called Making Toast. He described how at age 60, devastated by family tragedy, he stepped in to comfort and help raise his three-year-old grandson. The writing was dry-eyed, compassionate, sometimes rageful with tiny outbursts of bittersweet humor. Aha, I fine-tuned my wise guy writing style with compassion and bittersweet humor. And the very next day, I was able to write a decent second draft, five pages, and the following day, even more, how the episode affects my daily life. So here's to the inspirational power of well-chosen handouts. Number four on my list of barrier busters, the students themselves, they can make or break a workshop. Anna attracted and retained great students. They amplified the power and effectiveness of her teaching. Some of us students could be a bit annoying, but we were attentive, full of zest and collective talent, energized the whole classroom. Anna split us up into small discussion groups. We read each other's stories aloud. We untied the knots in each other's prose, and then we rushed home full of enthusiasm to do some inspired editing. There's lots more that can be said about student power, but let's move on. Barrier number five, barrier buster number five, incentives. In September, 2011, Anna turbocharged her workshop by inviting an internationally known author and teacher, our own Erin Byrne, to come to Paris and take over the class for a seven week workshop called Leaping Into the Void. Aaron busted barriers with an irresistible incentive, publication, publication in a forthcoming anthology. Every student who submitted a publication ready piece of work on time was assured of it. There was a deadline, December 1st, and it was non-negotiable. Of all the barrier busters I've talked about, I think firm deadlines with dire consequences are amongst the most powerful. I know they get me writing and over my obstacles. Aaron then stoked the flames of creativity by shooing us students out of the classroom, notebooks in hand, into the streets of Paris. 
The objective was to seek inspiration and start writing the moment it struck, that instinct and intuition be our guides. And right we did. With help from Aaron's powerful handouts and inspired writing prompts, most students blasted through the barriers. And after diligent polishing, every submission, I believe, qualified for publication in the anthology. Well, time's up. Back to you, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Martin. We're going to talk a lot about um, just about everything you brought up, but um, thank you. Okay, Jane Weston Vauclair is a published author on the French satirical press and is co-author with David Vauclair of De Charlie Abdo, hashtag Charlie, and Jou Histoire Perspectives. She is a translator, English language trainer, and creative writer based in Paris. Jane's prose is a lush and her characters are multi-layered. Her gifts are wide ranging. Jane and her husband, David, as I mentioned before, led a Paris salon about Charlie Hebdo. And she, so Jane has done quite a bit of academic writing. And when we first met, she was um, sort of like starting to, I think it was right when you were starting to venture into other kinds of writing. And now, um, her genre are short fiction, memoir, and poetry. Um, and I think I think she's practically tried every genre. We did a workshop once, uh, I think it was called Our Writing Palette when I was there. We were trying other genres, but Jane, um, Jane is always fascinating, always brilliant, and always interested. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say, Jane. So welcome. Thank you so much, Erin. Much appreciated. So yes, um, as the poet John Keats wrote, beauty is truth and truth beauty. And writing is difficult. Hopefully enjoyable too, but necessarily difficult. We are looking to use words as bridges between ourselves and others, and also between our thoughts and the world out there. You have to keep at it. Stumble, get up, stumble again. Like the Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, stand up eight. Mm -hmm. I learned this quote as I was doing my PhD thesis. This research was my apprenticeship in academic writing. I was very lucky to have good mentors at Bristol University in the UK. And we were pointed in the direction of George Orwell's Politics and the English Language, which I strove to follow in spirit, if not to the latter. I particularly appreciated the advice, never use a long word where a short one will do. I've always loved concision that is laden with meaning. I love ellipses. I love respecting the reader's time and intelligence. I trust the reader will get the point. In my academic writing, I sought to pack my thoughts densely into my paragraphs, chapters, journal articles. It's probably why for my research that I was drawn to the art of caricature, to the art of taking a line for a walk as the artist Paul Klee once wrote. When I came to Paris for my research, which was meant to be for one year, but it's been 15 years now, um, I was quickly drawn into the world of creative writing as Erin has said. To my mind, the nub of the exercise was the same, to communicate urgently to the reader, words laden with meaning, easy to read, yet rich in the potential to spark reflection. Why? The world is complicated. The world is seething with nuance. The world is surprising and often confounding. In fiction, you can dive into that with even more abandon as you have a freer frame than in academic writing. Like most people, I was drawn to writing from experience. The streets of Paris bristle with stories. I admire, I admire Balzac's desire to capture it all, to make his fiction a social encyclopedia, to throw it all out there for the reader to see with that 19th century confidence, this human comedy, the comédie humaine that we all live through. Nowadays, nowadays, we are all far too aware that the world will always escape the grasp of our pens, or more like it, our keyboards. 
yet we are still drawn to stories like campfires on a freezing night. And what better way to do so than in the company of kindred spirits? You know them when you see them. Some pass through your life as, and then you go on your vastly separate journeys. Others you sit down and spend hours together talking and sharing. The same goes with academia, although the pressures of the modern university can be incredibly alienating. And we are all at prey to the opposite of nuance in our thoughts and words. We're in prey to absolutist thinking, to polarizing conflicts, to the shutting down of dialogue and to the demonizing of others and their perspectives, alas. Yet, still we talk and still we write, sometimes falteringly, sometimes in a huge burst of inspiration. Whether it's academic writing or creative writing, I adhere to Voltaire. Doubt is an uncomfortable condition, but certainty is a ridiculous one. We have to remain humble, to accept that we will stumble, but be determined to continue. And that's easier in good company. And when you're also good to yourself in your endeavors too, because unfortunately life will test you and you'll need strong values and belief in the process to fall back on to make you strong enough to keep going. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, my next vignettes and postcards book was going to be about Spain, but when you were speaking, Jane, I thought maybe it should just be about writing and that would be the first piece in it. That was just gorgeous. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing more from you. Okay, next we have Philip Murray Lawson. His first work is a translation of the fan fiacal author Marcel Schwab. They appeared in Udolfo, the Gothic Society periodically, to which Philip also contributed nonfiction. His collection of horror stories, Heresies, was published in 2000. He's published in Vignettes and Postcards from Paris, of course. Contributes works of Manipian satire to Emanations, an annual anthology published by international authors. He lives in Paris where he runs Evolution ABC, a language consulting company. Philip has pursued his writing career. When I was thinking about Philip, I was like, what can I say about him? He has pursued his writing career with as Ray Bradley Group. He, uh, he did this salon ages ago on Menifian satire, which I know he'll be uh, sharing a little bit from one of his emanations pieces later. Philip, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Erin. You're welcome. So, yeah, Erin wanted me to speak a little bit about uh, mentoring. And I suppose with the subject of mentoring, in the beginning, there was the writing group, and very new at the beginning, there was Erin, uh, who, apart from having uh, many talents as a writer, also has a great talent, as you can probably see, as a networker. And uh, I met Erin at a time in my life where I was writing, but, you know, I was a little bit frustrated. Uh, I'd been published, but I wasn't getting published very much. And Erin uh, re recommended that I reach out to the writers that I really love, those, those well-known writers, that, those, those that are still alive, of course. And um, ever since I was about 14 years old, there's been one science, British science fiction writer that I've always read. And his name is Michael Moorcock. I, I don't know if he's well known in the States, but uh, he's, he's very respected in the UK. The Times describes him as one of uh, the UK's most important 20th century uh, authors. And, well, I started searching for him. I, I couldn't find him immediately, but I came across uh, an academic who lives in Ohio called uh, Carter Kaplan who had written some papers on Michael Moorcock. And Carter, to my delight, I saw he, he published what he described as a, an anthology of uh, avant-garde fiction, uh, obviously inspired by some of uh, Moorcock's uh, writings. So I sent a piece to Carter 
and uh, I was accepted. And over the years, I sent more pieces, and Carter became a friend. And finally, he introduced me to Michael Moorcock, who is still alive. And Michael Moorcock spends his time between Austin, Texas, and Paris, not Texas, but Paris, France. And uh, I was able to meet, have dinner with Michael and Linda, his wife, uh, with my wife, Nadine. We uh, had dinner together. And ever since then, we've become friends. And I see... Uh, I see Michael Moorcock every year, except when, of course, there are COVID uh, crises and this kind of thing. So, so that's a nice story in itself. Uh, and the, the best thing at in, in this year's uh, emanations, Michael has act, has actually actually contributed a story to the anthology, which is called "When a Planet Was a Planet." And so, I find myself published with uh, the very man I read when I was about 14 years old. So, so that's, that's absolutely wonderful for me. But I wouldn't, my writing wouldn't have reached the standard required, I think, without the writing group in Paris. And I'd just like to name uh, them. We have Martin with us, we have uh, Jane with us, but the, the group includes Anne, uh, Hannah, Emily, Pamela, and Rosemary at the moment. And all these people, uh, we don't always get on with what we, they don't always like what I, I write, but their feedback has always been invaluable. And uh, so, from, so you can have famous mentors who are famous uh, writers, but you can also have mentors who are simply writers and colleagues. Uh, so, so that's basically well, what I wish to say. And I would, I would encourage you, if you like speculative fiction, to um, to approach uh, emanations. It's uh, many of the stories are a bit like uh, Quentin Tarantino doing the Twilight Zone, something like that. So, so it's quite it's entertaining and fun. So, oh, excellent! That's a great uh, comparison, Philip Quentin Tarantino. Um, I was remembering that the the last time I was in Paris, I had to kind of flee because of COVID. But when I first arrived, we didn't really know that it was going to be a big pandemic. And Philip, we we went out for dinner and we were talking, and I told you that it sounded like something out of one of your stories. <laughs> so um, wow, that's pretty weird. Okay, so I want to spend a few moments talking about vignettes and postcards from Paris. Um, this is a copy of the first edition. As I said, Anna and I put it together, we edited it, we published it. Um, it has stories and um, photos and it's divided into sections. And we launched it at Shakespeare and Company in, I think, May of 2012. We also had an event at um, Café de Pont Neuf, I think, a reading there. Um, but this book, like, because this, this workshop I did, The Sleeping Into the Void, I wanted to get these guys out of their heads. And so Martin, I think, mentioned that I kind of sent them out. Uh, out into the bookstore or out in the surrounding area and I was trying to get them to follow to kind of follow their writerly intuition we my last uh, salon was about intuition so this kind of follows on that you know writerly intuition has a lot to do with instincts and some of them some of them we we train into ourselves like this writing group like you do with each other but um, so the instincts are just like our natural writing, creative, observational instincts. And so um, anyway, the stories that sprung from that, from just walking around and stopping when you felt like you should stop and seeing what was in front of you and just writing without thinking too much, uh, the stories were really magnificent. And the other exercise that I, we drew from the book from was one, you know, as Martin mentioned, Anna was just like, she was so incredible with her writing prompts. I really wished 
she would write a book of just writing prompts because she was just so, so incredibly brilliant with that. And so um, we just took like a postcard. There's postcards all over the streets of Paris. And we just grabbed a postcard and started writing. Um, and I think this group was so used to, they were so eager to have writing prompts and Anna had kind of trained them like, here's how to write when you get this inspiration that it made the stories in this book just, just really fabulous. And then when we did the um, editing, which you guys all kind of talked about, it's the grueling part. And so, this this book it it did really well like it won all these awards and so um the second edition my agent has also a publishing company and they said we want to do a new edition we want to we want to republish this under a bigger you know because Anna and I just self-published the first one so they said we want to publish it and we want you to make it a longer book. So I added 21, and this time, like Anna was busy with other stuff. So I did the editing for the newer edition and kept the entire original, um, the original book is the second half of this book. But, you know, I was pretty astonished because Billy Collins gave me two poems for this and Don George gave me a story, Marcia de Sanctus. Uh, there's a chapter um, with the, I call them the top hatted spoken word Paris, poets of Paris. And I don't know if you can see this fabulous photo by Sabine Dandour. Um, but they each have, I think one of them, I think David Sear was, has a poem and uh, Alberto and David Barnes have stories. So, um, this one was launched in 2016 and for the newer version you can find uh there's a, a podcast that we did at the commonwealth club of california that you can find on my website but i wanted to read just a little tiny bit from the forward of the original edition and then i've also asked martin and jane to read uh, very short excerpts of their pieces. And then I asked Philip to read an excerpt of one of his emanation pieces. So um, this is from the foreword of the first edition. And I hope you find it and read it because there's a, quite a lot about Anna and the way she teaches uh, in the introduction. I'm just going to read you the very beginning. The room waits. Voices and footsteps from the bookstore underneath echo in the empty space. Through an open window, the buzz of traffic breezes in past pink geraniums, which linger in their wooden box, savoring the last light of day. Dust motes circle in rhythm. An old table appears to have pushed aside a, ch aside a chess set on its own top to clear space for paper and pen. This is George Whitman's private library at Shakespeare and Company Bookstore. For six decades, he presided at the cash register downstairs, shouted commands across the room at random strangers, invited many to tea or to stay, and swished between bookshelves. But now in September of 2011, he lies in bed inside his apartment, upstairs as his life ebbs from his frail body. George's spirit still infuses the shop, but his is now a wispy presence. The people clomp, stumble, and tiptoe up the stairs. Collectively, they read, write, and speak dozens of languages. They come from all over the world, Brazil, New Zealand, Ireland, Holland, Iran, Lebanon, and other places. Their communal consciousness overflows with precise details, harvested impressions, and thriving ideas. On this warm evening, they came from all over Paris, on foot, on bicycles, on metro, on buses, to create something tangible out of the richness of their lives. 
and that tangible thing ended up in this book. So um, um, I asked Martin to read a little bit from his piece, Inspired Writing, and that is from the inspiration chapter. And then Jane is going to read from the end of August from the visions chapter. So Martin. Thank you. <clears throat> Wolf Blitzer, CNN reporting from Paris, around the plaza of world famous Notre Dame, talking to fledgling writer Martin Rain. Martin, hundreds of tourists are milling about, and here you sit, tapping furiously on your laptop, immersed in what can only be inspired writing. Absolutely right, Walt. How on earth did you guess? Reporter's instinct, Martin. Inspired writing is news these days, rare as solar eclipses and abominable snowmen. The question our viewers keep asking is, why doesn't every writer just put his mind to it and get inspired? Well, because minds don't cooperate, Wolf. You can't think your way to great prose, at least not with my mind calling the shots. He narrates, I type. He spots typos, I fix them. He orders rewrites, I acquiesce, it's chaos. And he critiques as I type. One minute it's, oh God, pure nectar. And the next, you embarrass us, Martin. The publishers will puke. And what's the secret of inspired writing, Martin? A quiet mind, Walt, simple as that. Show us some writing, Martin, your opening paragraph. Sure thing. 7 a.m., heavy breathing. I stumble downstairs, open the front door. It's weasel and dwarf. Dwarf's tall, pinch-faced, wrapped in a trench coat. Dwarf's humpbacked, one-eyed, dripping saliva. Weasel hands me his business card. Electricity Company of France. Your house, he hisses, uses too much power, more than a small factory. My employer is curious, a small house like yours, so much electricity, what's going on? Dwarf tugs at his leash. My, associ my associate, whispers Weasel, would like to come in and look around. Martin, I'm hooked. Why doesn't everyone go mindless and write prose just like that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's kind of funny because it's like, and we can talk about this later, but when you write prose like that, which is clearly like coming straight from your creative nerve center, then it's a risk to publish it. Right? Like you got these crazy characters. And anyway, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, thank you, Martin. I love that piece. Uh, Jane, I'd like you to read from the end of August, please. Yes, what a pleasure. Okay, the end of August. Light streams into the station. Trains pull in, trains pull out, dirty and battered, shuddering with life. Noise reverberates up to the high arched ceiling as families, backpackers and professionals jostle. The departure, board, the departure board blinks, shuffling destinations and platforms. Espresso cups are hastily emptied and cigarette smoke lingers. The season is turning. Parisians are returning from the south and the sea. New beginnings infuse the air. I step out from the double doors of a TGV marked Marseille Saint-Charles, Paris Gare de Lyon. My clothes are crumpled, but I'm dutifully blending in with the perennial Parisian insistence on darker fabrics. I would need to speak in my off-key French to be noticed as an Englishwoman. Now that I'm out of the train, there are hollow pangs of absence in my chest. I recently lost my mother in a brutal way. Since then, it's been hard to follow even simple conversations. I don't want a wave of grief to swell up in the midst of so many anonymous faces, so I push myself to concentrate, placing one foot in front of the other. 
As I near the, near the exit, I lurch to avoid a toddler who has flopped to the floor. He falters between wailing and laughter as his mother lifts him to his feet. Outside the station, buses rumble past with their packed cargoes, jolting and bolting in tempo with the traffic lights. Drivers drum their fingers. The leaden humidity of the summer has lifted and the city is picking itself up after a dormant August of boarded up businesses. A few autumn leaves have already fallen and cooler September air is testing its teeth. Oh, thank you. Your writing has such rich sensory details. And, you know, we're going to talk more about editing later, but when we were putting together this book, when Anna and I were editing the pieces and we were rather grueling in, I mean, I always am, in making people focus, right? And so your piece, like it's all about your mother and you have the toddler and like everything is just so streamlined. So thank you, Jane. All right, so Philip's piece, uh, Life with Tobias is in the Duende chapter. I've been yet some postcards, but um, I asked him to read one from Emanations. I'm not sure which one you're going to read, but I, I have to remark at how utterly um, exciting it is that you are with Michael, your literary hero, in the pages of, you know, of that anthology that just gives me chills, Philip. So... Oops, Philip, I think you're on mute still somehow. Hello. There you are. Okay. So I'll, I'll read uh, just the opening uh, paragraphs from my story in the new emanations, which is called, uh, my, my story is called The Thirteenth Variant. When their old friend, Bertie Mapplethorpe, visited that Sunday. Julian and Luja were tucking into a late, late breakfast. It was something of a picnic that they had spread on the living room floor. Two, two bottles of Riesling, a bowl of black spaghetti sprinkled with basil, two dozen oysters, two lemons, six slices of brown bre bread, and a dish of butter whirls. Luja was, was kneeling and Julian lounging on an embroidered coverlet, a splendid satin piece snatched from a Croatian monastery. Despite news that the virus had mutated, Julian was feeling at peace with the world. The array of rugged shells wafted forth scents that seemed, for the moment at least, uncontaminated. His only disappointment was that the wine was Riesling and not a Ruina Blanc de Blanc. The lockdown had not allowed time to replenish his cellar. With a deft movement, Luja sprung a shell. As the knocking became a hammering, Julian grimaced. He wondered if Maxine's click and collect robo boy had forgotten something, but a quick count revealed all oysters, bread slices, and butter whirls present and correct. Luja handed him an oyster. It was the 13th. He had the impression that the oyster was watching him. A drop of lemon caused a shimmer. Coloured spots shifted into a kaleidoscopic dance. They coalesced until they formed the milky reflection of his face. It was delicately framed by twinkling tentacles. Was this, he wondered, quite normal? Ever since being vaccinated, he had opted for the Goering decree developed by his old friend, Dr. Helmut Ewers. Everything seemed slightly out of sync. He gouged with his fork. His image rippled and died. As his mouth filled with ocean, his heart sank. The oyster was sick. I'll stop there for a moment. <laughs> so apparently this pandemic is something out of one of your stories now. Thank you. Okay, I have gobs of questions to ask you guys. Um, I had these three send me um, 
recent pieces. Philip sent me this piece, which is really fabulous, I have to say. Um, but I noticed because in the intervening years of when we first published this book, when I first started working with you and um, and swooping in and kind of working with you in little in little periods and then having you for the past seven years be involved in this writing group, um, I felt like your writing had changed and uh, really developed in a very specific ways. Um, Martin, I feel like your irony is tight, tightened it, like you've tightened your sense of irony, um, almost like a, a dagger. <laughs> um, Jane, I felt like you, and, and you can see that this gift that you have of kind of using these sensory details and, and drawing us into a world that that is just like instantaneous. Like in the recent piece that you sent me, it's like we're drawn into this world from the first word practically. Um, and I thought that was really incredible. And then Philip, uh, your character and dialogue have only just like um, become clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. And I, I can even tell from that excerpt that you read that like you're using detail in exactly, you know, like to, to just take a spotlight and like shine it on your focus. So I wondered if you guys could talk about how like, how your writing group has helped your writing develop and how you feel like it's it's changed and like uh, maybe maybe include like a couple of things that you've really worked on in the last few years on your writing and you and how you feel it's changed it doesn't matter to me who goes first so just chime in you three uh, i think um, i think for me what the writing group has done it's it's the feedback that people have given and i i've learned as a writer not to when people give me feedback, to, to really try to listen to what they say. Uh, and I see many people, many perhaps, uh, let's say, inexperienced writers, when they receive their first feedback, they, they immediately start to justify and to, to try to explain what the readers should have understood. And I think this writing group has, has taught me to just listen to what they say and to be aware that what I've written is what they understood, is what they understand, is not what I imagined I had written. And even if the feedback sometimes seems to be completely off the wall, if I, if I feel sometimes that the reader has missed a point, there is always a kernel of truth in that feedback. So I, I accept, I listen to everything that people say and I I make a note of it and I really reflect on on what they try to say, even if I don't really understand it, but I always change something in reaction to the feedback. I, uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry, always, keep going. And, it's always, and the result is it's always better. Thank you. Um, I always tell people like, you don't get to sit next to your reader and whisper in their ear. <laughs> you have to, you have to have it mm. in, in print. Um, but also, Philip, like your writing is, um, it reminds me of going to the Pompidou, right? Like you go to the, you go see modern art and you, you are meant to be disturbed and you are meant to then think and, you know, it leads to other things. And so it must be an interesting exercise for you to get feedback because if, if someone says that really disturbs me, you, you, you score one for the team, right? <laughs> like you're like, okay. That's, that's, go good, that's good feedback. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Martin, Jane, do you have anything to add? Well, the kind of feedback uh, that I enjoy is the fact that we routinely read passages aloud from our own work or each other's work. 
And it's the listening to my story being read by someone else where I get implicitly a whole lot of feedback. For instance, as they read, either they laugh at the right places or their interpretation is such that they hit all the right emotional notes. But I keep track of that. And I'm really heartened when their reading and their interpretation is consistent with my intention because I feel, wow, I scored, I got it, it hit its mark. And when the reading of my stuff is flat and they just go through it, and it was a point at where I was hoping for some sort of theatricality in their interpretation, I realized my writing missed its mark. And that's what I call implicit feedback. It doesn't mean that they've written stuff on, my, on a draft of my writing. It's something that I've deduced just in the simple process of having other people read it back. And the people in our extended writing group are sensitive, they are intuitive and are able to, in fact, uh, capture the meaning when it's there and just skate over it when it's not. So that's one aspect of the participation uh, in this special group of talented friends and, and writers it gives me. I'll wow. stop here for a moment. That's incredible. Um, because I, I've never actually really heard of that. Right? Like I always direct people and I always, always, always for my own work, constantly, constantly, constantly read it aloud because you can tell when you are reading aloud and your antenna are set to your instincts, like you can tell what you need to add and what you don't, if you don't feel like reading it out loud, you don't need it in your work, right? <laughs> but, but what a fascinating, um, idea to have other people reading it out loud and and that really does give you the um it gives you the feedback that they know they get what you're doing for sure right incredible jane how about you it just reminds me of a little story uh we've been philip martin others been quite a few years now that we've been more or less formally meeting as a group and i was looking through my old pieces for thinking about this and I remember that there was a piece that I wrote that nobody understood nobody <laughs> um and I was so sure at the time I was like that makes sense you know it's a bit subtle but you know I, you can see that this is the sky and he's hallucinating and he's imagining where he is I read it and I didn't understand it I was like I have no idea what I meant when I wrote it and I took their word for it I was like clearly Clearly, it's not easy to follow, but on the same way, on a certain level, I, I was like, oh, that's weird, you know, I'm sure it is somehow understandable. So, yeah, it is true, like, getting other people's honest responses is fantastic, and I do, in many ways, these days, write for the group, or at least, you know, they're part of the people I have in mind when I'm writing, it's really nice. Right. Um, and also, also, it helps us, I think, to assume the role of the reader when we're editing our own work, right? Like, so we write our work in the role of the writer, and we edit it. You know, I always, I have an image in my mind of my reader who has, um, you know, Italo Calvino wrote, uh, it's the very first few pages in If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. I think I shared it at one of our workshops, but um, he writes this whole, it's directed directly at the reader. It's like, okay, you're sitting in a chair, you're getting comfortable. Oh no, you're not quite comfortable. You're gonna squeeze over here and you're gonna do this. Oh, there's this person walking through the room. You're distracting. And so I always imagine my reader being completely impatient, completely intolerable, completely like if I lose their concentration for one second I've lost them and so when I'm editing then you know I go through writing and I might edit once as a writer but then I go in and edit as that high maintenance reader and you know like it's a whole different um it's a whole different experience so I'm wondering with each of you if you can talk about like what your most the most challenging piece that you've ever written 
like your biggest challenge as a writer and kind of how that process, um, how you went through that process with, with the piece? Well, my biggest challenge was the story I described in um, Loss and Discovery, writing about a traumatic incident um, and having in the privacy of the writing group, the freedom to describe my ex-wife's psychological condition, uh, which was unstable, um, but I could do that because I was in a trusted environment, but it's a total invasion of her privacy were I to elaborate on that and try and publish it. And that's probably the biggest block I have to completing that story, invasion of privacy. There is of course my own um, fear of looking weak and wimpy in the face of the actual transaction on that apocryphal night when she did stomp out. I didn't stand much up for any of my principles, my beliefs. I uh, chickened out being strong, confrontational, and revealing those sorts of weaknesses that I don't want to project in writing to anybody anywhere at any time. So I've never really finished that piece. It's uh, too much uh, intrusion into revealing who I am inside, sort of a milk with toast and the, uh, bringing forward uh, my wife's uh, situation. Well, of course, you know what my advice is going to be. Get Fictionalize back. my tale. <laughs> <laughs> Write it in the third person. <laughs> Change well, the names. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. You know, like like what I have, what I keep discovering. I mean, I'm working on this novel now, and and you know, a novel is self -re revelatory in a different way. But like my essays. The essays where I've gone the deepest and been the most honest and actually revealed like the most vulnerable things in my life have been the most successful essays that they're the ones that people respond to because it's as Jane said at the beginning of the session about humanity and like we're looking for we're looking for that universal emotion and even when you were just talking about how you felt sort of helpless and you didn't really stand up for your principles. You know, this is a universal thing that we all have these moments where that happens. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, I have a lot of friends who have written pretty deep memoirs and they always have that struggle of, you know, what to reveal about other people. It's a, and it's even a dance in my own work that I've had to do. So, uh, but I would say like, you, you can get into your own experience without revealing everything about hers. So of course, I'm gonna direct you back to that most challenging piece. <laughs> uh, Jane, Philip, do you have a challenging piece you'd like to share about? Uh, I would say my most piece of academic writing. Um, I. It was because I studied the French satirical press and uh, I had basically kind of finished my life in academia more or less, but uh, in fact not, uh, because of what, unfortunately there were the Charlie Hebdo attacks in 2015. And almost immediately I was contacted by a journal asking if I could write a piece about it. Uh, and they were like, sorry, but our deadline is in like three weeks or whatever. For an academic piece, it was incredibly short. And I was really, 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 hit by the tragedy um but I told myself if there was ever a piece I had to write this was it right. and also that I had to be very very like you know keep my not exactly distance but really be like okay what is the heart of this and, and try and find something to say that for me I could look back on five years later whatever and say yeah that was what I wanted to say and uh I remember just sort of sitting there like part of me just completely emotional um and the other half being like okay just do it um and fortunately I found a thing that I wanted to say um that I thought helped explain some of it um and in that way I, that was fantastic because it was something I was able to use in the future and you know but it, it was very very challenging to 
to do that because I mostly felt like not <laughs> not right. yeah. I mean that's where the heat is right in our emotions yeah. but sometimes like you know sometimes we don't have a choice of when to write a certain piece and so you have to you know wow that's incredible thank you um Philip, we have we are a little bit short on time, but I wanted to give you a chance to maybe talk about your most challenging. Well, I, I don't have anything anything like Jane or, or Martin, but what I find the most challenging is perhaps life itself, and to try to try to write my journal, my diary with real honesty. And I find that I find that the most challenging exercise to to try to express really what I feel about situations that happen in my life, which afterwards, once I've distanced myself from them by putting them in my journal, I transform into fiction later. But uh, I find the uh, the step of uh, writing a diary and uh, as clearly as possible and as honestly as possible uh, for. Uh, really helps in uh, creating uh, fictions afterwards. Wow, that's incredible. You know, uh, Robert Owen Butler wrote that book called From Where You Dream. It's about writing. It's just an incredible book. And he talks about that. He talks about that when you journal, you're really writing a diary of emotions. And so it, when you write honestly like that, like you were talking about, it just makes your writing so much more clear because clarity is what we're always seeking. So, wow. Thank you so much, you three. Um, I was thinking that leap, the leaping into the void uh, workshop might be a good one to teach maybe on leap, like maybe, a, maybe teach it again, just because it is kind of a timeless thing. Um, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to, to have you guys have presented. Thank you so much. Um, our next salon is November 30th and it's with host and producer of the Fly Brother television series, Ernest White II, who was actually with me. I think you guys all met him. He was in Paris um, a couple times ago. He did a event with me. Um, Anyway, his, his series pr premiered on public television last year and they just wrapped up season two, but you can find season one on the PBS uh, website. You can watch some episodes before you uh, meet Ernest. Uh, so I would recommend that. It's gonna be really great. So it's uh, November 30th at 11 a.m. for an hour. Um, I want to give you each like just a few seconds to kind of have the last word here. So we would go Martin, Jane, Philip, and just give us like your last little bit of writing wisdom. Well, I'm just filled with gratitude for the assignment you gave me to recreate my workshop experience. It basically explains why I am where I am now. And it was a pure joy um, going through the archives and rebuilding and re-experiencing those days and those years with Anna and with you. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Martin. And you guys have really paid it forward in your group for sure. Jane? I, I guess uh, I would just repeat, um, you know, that maxim that I'm sure lots of you already know the the full time full full down seven times get up eight. That's the process. So yeah, always uh, keep for doing what you love, and uh, we'll come together. Incredible! Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, no, I have nothing more to say. But but I would like to thank uh, all the people who have tuned in this evening to, to, to listen to, to us. Uh, it's great to see all, all these people, which proves that uh, the world is full of motivated writers. That's for sure. I, I just think that uh, you three, like your insight has been so invaluable and it seriously does make me think about doing an anthology of writings about, or, you know, like writing, about writing um and you three would be 
the first people in the book. So anyway, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.